Thank you everyone for joining us. And um, we're really excited to talk with you about science and health equity. You can submit questions and feedback using tinyurl.com and wrong not to test. So with that, um, I wanted to thank our organizers briefly. Um, thank you very much for making this event uh, possible. And with that, um, Dr. Michael Minna from the Harvard School of Public Health, please take us away. Thanks everyone for, for joining. My name is Michael Minna. I'm an assistant professor of epidemiology and immunology at the Harvard School of Public Health and an associate medical director at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, where I help to oversee COVID testing for our patients uh, and the population at large. Uh, so the, the title of, of this meeting is It's Wrong Not to Test. What has been really driving so much of the discussion around testing uh, has really been uh, the, the thinking around testing as a medical tool. Uh, there are other tools that are in our arsenal and other ways to use testing that go beyond medicine. Despite medicine always being uh, generally the reason that we normally think or how we think about testing, how we regulate testing, uh, there is a whole different form of testing uh, that is also important and I argue is more important during a pandemic like SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 which is both surveillance testing and more importantly here, screening testing. Surveillance testing is the type of testing uh, that is distinct from medical diagnostic testing. It could be across whole populations at once. It could be in wastewater. It could be testing surfaces. It's really in order to evaluate uh, where cases are and where the virus is at the population level. There's another form of testing as well. And this is what I refer to as screening testing. Uh, there's multiple types of screening tests. Most people, when you say screening tests, they might think of entrance screening, which, which you might think that's something that you need to get in order to get onto a flight, uh, in order to enter into an office building, etc. But there's a whole different type of testing as well, which is uh, public health testing, uh, which is really designed around stopping outbreaks. Uh, there's an epidemiological uh, number, the reproductive number of a virus called R, and when that's above one, it means that an outbreak is increasing exponentially. And when we get R below one, meaning for every 100 people who are infected, they, they infect fewer than 100 people, uh, then, then outbreaks start to diminish very quickly. And public health testing, uh, the notion that we can get a test to enough people on a frequent enough basis to catch them when they are infectious and pull them out and ask them to isolate on their own uh, is a very effective way to potentially get R below one and get cases to diminish and prevent outbreaks from arising. Uh, so these three different forms of testing, although all of our, uh, the metrics through which we generally are evaluating tests is really through uh, uh, essentially diagnostic tests, these other two forms of tests are, are uh, largely potentially more important during a pandemic than personal health medical diagnostics. Because it's all about tackling a pandemic like SARS-CoV-2 is really about how do we prevent transmission at the community level. Uh, next slide. And so uh, we have uh, tools that are available. And while diagnostic testing might be low frequency, very high sensitivity tests, there's a whole different type of testing where we take tests that look like, they might look like these kinds of tests. They're just little um, paper strip tests. These are just encased in a little plastic sheath. Uh, and we can get these out to individuals uh, into their homes, for example, or into the workplace, the school. And we can ask people to test on a routine basis. And if individuals test uh, uh, on a daily basis or, or multiple times per week, we can actually start to see large improvements at the whole population level. So if we have an outbreak and if we have no testing at all, we have 100% of cases relative to, you know, relative number of cases might be set at 100. Um, but if we were to go and test enough people frequently enough that we are likely to catch people uh, while they're infectious or before they even become infectious and ask them to isolate on their own, uh, then we can really greatly diminish uh, diminish cases. And it's not about, it's not really about whether the test is a high sensitivity or a low sensitivity test. Uh, it's really about the frequency with which we test. Next slide. At a population level, if we were to, uh, it, this is an example, 
Uh, and what I'm showing here is if you have an outbreak that's going very high, it's going, it's going up quickly. If we were to test, say, 50% of a community uh, and, and essentially provide tests to people to perform in their home, and 50% of individuals could potentially test uh, twice a week, that would be enough to get R below one, start diminishing a rapidly growing outbreak, make a turnover, and start getting control of that outbreak in a matter of weeks. So public health testing can be an extremely, extremely powerful form of, of testing that we haven't really yet utilized, primarily because there's been a lot of confusion around what makes a test good or not good. And so, um, but, but what, we're, what I think people who are going to be speaking today uh, are coming at this from a public, from testing for public good, testing to empower people to understand their infectious status. It's not testing for medical purposes. That is still needed. But this other form of testing where, so, where any, any average individual out in the community who might want to know, am I infectious before I go and visit my mother? Am I infectious before I go to school? Am I infectious before I go to work or to church? Giving people the power to know whether or not they are likely infectious can allow the public to start participating in public health in a much more profound way and can allow us not just to start keeping individual uh, areas and locations safe, but actually participating in public health from this much more broad approach where we start to see outbreaks subside and uh, ultimately support, for example, the vaccines that are coming on board, support the distancing efforts, support the mask efforts. It's another tool and a potentially very powerful tool to support our overall objectives in this pandemic, which are essentially to, uh, to get rid of the virus from our communities and, and decrease morbidity and mortality as much as possible. Sharon. Thank you, Dr. Minna. Thank you. All right, so for the rest of our um, program today, uh, we are going to be uh, getting a, a brief introduction about health equity from Ishan Desai from Partners in Health. We're gonna share with you the content of our commentary briefly. And then we're gonna have a few words from Art Kaplan from NYU uh, to our, our leading bioethicist and our, our voice for change and reason uh, about why it's important to have rapid tests alongside other interventions like vaccines and to do so in an equitable way. And uh, if we have any time at the end, we'll um, hopefully incorporate some Q&A from the audience. So please do use the tinyurl.com wrong not to test. Let us know if there's anything you'd like us to try to respond to. Thank you. So with that, Ishan, would you like to take it away? Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Ishan Desai. I work as a research assistant to Dr. Paul Farmer, uh, who is a physician and a med medical anthropologist who co-founded uh, the nonprofit Partners in Health. Um, which some of you may know, um, if you don't, it's, it's an organization that seeks to deliver high quality medical care in places that are burdened by extreme uh, poverty and uh, very weak health systems. Um, and so PIH initially began working in a, a very rural part of Haiti uh, in a community of dispossessed farmers. Uh, but in the ensuing decades, we would go on to uh, work in many other countries, um, so other parts of Haiti, but also Peru, Russia, um, Rwanda, Lesotho, Malawi, the Navajo Nation. Actually, I think next slide should should um, indicate that. Oh, there you go. Well, I was trying to remember them from memory, but um, so yeah, Rwanda, Lesotho, Malawi, uh, Kazakhstan, Mexico, and then more recently Liberia and Sierra Leone in the wake of Ebola um, and. Of course, uh, now in the United States uh, in response to COVID-19. Uh, next slide. So, so yeah, you know, as I was kind of listening to Dr. Mena's comments and reading kind of the, the latest iteration of this article, um, I was really struck by how this particular issue, you know, this kind of um, the, the this very, you know, common sense approach to a comprehensive uh, response to COVID-19 has been met with some kind of resistance. Um, and this kind of unfounded resistance to, to, 
rapid coronavirus testing to me has really kind of mirrored a lot of the false dichotomies that have long patterned uh, social responses to epidemics and pandemics. You know, rather, rather than trying to seek to bring the full might of both, you know, modern science and public health, or um, as, as Dr. Minna said, uh, you know, the full arsenal of tools that we have um, to bear on the greatest health crisis we've seen in over a century, um, we've, we've fallen into this, you know, uh, common habit of trying to pit interventions against each other. All right, so you either PCR or rapid testing, or rapid antigen testing, or um, you know statements like you know if we introduce rapid testing, then we risk doing more harm than good um, because of you know X Y Z concerns. Um, so you know I'm I'm really just deeply grateful for the leadership of Dr. Mina and, and the entire rapid test team uh, for the brisk advocacy you've undertaken to integrate uh, rapid testing into, you know, a, a very comprehensive approach to COVID-19. Um, so I'd like to kind of reflect on the work that's presented in this, in this article by recalling what I and many uh, at Partners in Health consider one of the biggest barriers to health equity, both here in the US and globally. Um, and that is a failure of imagination. Um, so I'd like to frame my comments around this quote uh, from Dr. Farmer who wrote, Failures of imagination are the costliest failures. When the iron cage of rationality leads to a poverty of poverty of, ima of imagination, cynicism and disengagement follow. True accompaniment does not privilege technical expertise above solidarity, compassion, and a willingness to take what may seem insuperable challenges. Next slide. Yeah, so, um, so, you know, I'd like to kind of uh, describe what I mean as this barrier to health equity uh, through a couple of cases uh, that PIH in particular has been involved in over the years. Um, so the advent of antiretroviral therapy in the mid 1990s was groundbreaking for many reasons. Um, of course, most importantly for, you know, the way it converted HIV from or HIV disease from a death sentence into a chronic infection that could be well managed with proper care. Um, but even as the therapy was rolled out uh, with great enthusiasm um, in places like the US, um, there was a, a, a kind of lethal uh, fail failure of imagination when it came to delivering um, this new innovation uh, in settings of poverty, um, especially in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean. Um, so in, in um, I'd, I'd like to kind of just illustrate this with these two quotes. Um, you know, in 1998, the head of, of the HIV AIDS division at USAID said, if we used antiviral drugs and treatment regimens similar to those used in the US, it would cost approximately 35 billion per year to treat those infected in the, develop, in the developing world. How can we get involved in care in the face of some staggering statistics? And likewise, you know, public health experts writing The Lancet um, pointed out uh, through, 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 through modeling that data on the cost, effective, cost effectiveness of HIV prevention in Sub-Saharan Africa um, and on highly active antiretroviral therapy uh, indicate that prevention is at least 28 times more cost effective uh, than antiretroviral therapy. And that the next major increments of HIV funding in Sub-Saharan Africa should be devoted mainly to prevention. Um, so, you know, I think this is in many ways reflective of um, these kinds of false dichotomies that, that we're seeing now even around the testing um, debate and, and that uh, groups like rapid tests, um, you know, are trying to debunk, uh, which is this idea that we need to choose, we need to make either or choices um, in the midst of a massive emergency, right? Uh, next, next slide. So, um, yeah, so I um, so Partners in Health um, has tried to counter such failures of imagination. Um, in 1998, we launched uh, the HIV Equity Initiative. Meaning, not me. I was six years old at the time. But uh, our, our founders and and um, you know our, our whole team in Haiti launched the HIV Equity Initiative um, to provide antiretroviral viral therapy to patients living with HIV. And it was really a, a community health worker led model. Um, you know, a very community-based, home-based approach, similar to what's being advocated here for rapid testing, really to try to decentralize um, services um, at, at kind of the home level within communities where people work, where people pray. Um, so, uh, you know, Partners in Health, uh, you know, ran this program 
treated an initial set of 50 patients before expanding to a much larger cohort, um, and ultimately proved uh, that the integration of HIV prevention and care was possible in rural and poverty-stricken settings. Um, and you know what we the graph that you see on the right is just a um, a description of what the impact uh, of of this work has been as a result of um, kind of worldwide activism for you know, expanded treatment access. So you see AIDS deaths declining, um, you know, throughout throughout the decade from 2002 to 2012 um, as the number of people receiving ART uh, increases. Next slide. So, so another kind of failure of imagination uh, is related to cholera in Haiti. Um, and, you know, 10 months after the earthquake that struck that country in 2010, PIH turned its attention to another crisis, uh, which was an explosive epidemic of cholera, which is, um, you know, until recently the world's largest cholera epidemic. Um, and, um, you know, what was especially striking at the time uh, was kind of this either or argument uh, that we're seeing now with COVID, um, which is, you know, we had licensed cholera vaccines that had been proven both safe and effective in clinical trials. Um, and they would ultimately remain unavailable to the majority of patients for several years into the emergency. Um, and, you know, when, when colleagues at Partners in Health advocated for a more comprehensive approach to cholera treatment and prevention that um, incorporated vaccines, they were often met with bitter disapproval and dismissed as kind of unrealistic. Some would say that it's too expensive in resource limited settings. Others um, pitted vaccination against other kind of control measures. So like, um, you know, oral vaccines would divert attention and scarce resources from water and sanitation projects. Um, again, this is without really any sort of empirical backup. Um, next slide. So, uh, so yeah, PIH, um, PIH had to, again, counter this failure of imagination by um, building a program to deliver two doses of oral cholera vaccine to people in rural Haiti. Um, and again, this was at a time when, you know, many policymakers considered cholera vac vaccination unfeasible or, um, you know, a distraction. And, um, you know, PIH's efforts helped to demonstrate that comprehensive cholera prevention and treatment, including vaccination, were possible and that they were actually synergistic. Um, and so this would end up kind of shifting international health policy in many ways and, and catalyze the, um, the creation of a global vaccine stockpile, uh, which has since distributed millions of doses in cholera epidemic around the world. So as I've tried to show, uh, promoting health equity requires that we try to interrogate um, confident claims that are often advanced to exclude many people from um, the highest standard of care. And, you know, these are almost always people who are marginalized by poverty, inequality, racism, gender inequity, and other social forces. Um, so in this kind of third example, in the case of Ebola in West Africa, which quickly became the largest recorded Ebola epidemic um, in history, uh, there was often a great deal of confidence about Ebola's uh, high case fatality rates, and it often went unquestioned, um, which led to uh, very kind of substandard medical care and fueled quite a bit of resistance to any attempts to actually improve the quality of, of care delivered to patients in West Africa itself. Um, facilities that you know were meant to care for Ebola patients usually prioritized isolation and containment, um, but they offered very little in the way of treatment. As you can see in this kind of um, grim uh, photo of an Ebola isol isolation unit in Liberia, um, and then one logistician working with Doctors Without Borders, just to cite one example, um, said, with a mortality rate of up to 90%, we know that most people in the treatment ward will not come out. We do, we do the most we can for them. Whatever the patient wants, the patient gets. Special food, new items of clothing. It's easy to do and it does them good. So, I mean, you know, there are many aspects of this that I think are problematic, but um, you know, if Ebola is indeed almost universally fatal, uh, then what explains the kind of shocking inequity uh, that's shown uh, in the graph on the right? You can see that, you know, mortality in a cohort of Ebola patients who were treated in West Africa was over 70%, but among American citizens treated in U.S. hospitals, it was 0%, none died. Um, in other words, in settings in which high quality supportive and critical care 
can be provided, it's very clear that Ebola is not a death sentence. It's eminently treatable even in the absence of specific antiviral therapies. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so, you know, when Partners in Health launched its Ebola response in Liberia and Sierra Leone in 2014, narrowing this disparity of outcomes that we just talked about was a central goal. And that meant elevating the quality of care and integrating preventive and therapeutic approaches rather than kind of pitting them against each other, as we've seen with AIDS, cholera, and now also Ebola. Um, and then kind of more related to the, um, to kind of the discussion of rapid testing, you know, any attempt to achieve equity of outcomes also demand, demanded, in the case of Ebola, a much more robust commitment to testing, diagnosing, um, and, you know, just introducing, uh, you know, re uh, robust laboratory capacity. So in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, where most of the cases were registered, um, you know, there was, uh, there were very few uh, laboratory facilities. They were effectively diagnostic deserts. Um, in fact, at the start of the outbreak, um, there was not one laboratory in the entire region that was able to perform an RT-PCR test for the Ebola virus. Um, so health authorities would invariably fail to identify the virus um, as the cause of infections until months after the outbreak already began. And even then that only happened once samples were shipped north uh, to laboratories in France. Um, and you know, I think as the epidemic wore on, uh, there was um, kind of an increase in diagnostic capacity, but a lot of it was very centralized and concentrated in you know, specialized biosecure labs that were off very uh, far from kind of the main Ebola hotspots, which meant that patients would have to wait many days and even over a week to get results, um, not unlike what we've seen with kind of COVID over the past year. So obviously this has very dire implications for further transmission, for triage, for infection control, nosocomial spread, um, and of course, uh, clinical care for patients. Um, so it wasn't uncommon, for example, to, um, to have a patient die before the Ebola test came back positive, um, or conversely, to get infected in an Ebola ward, even though you may have been free of the virus prior to admission to the, to the ward. Um, so to help kind of improve this uh, delivery problem, Partners in Health was involved in conducting field validation studies of two rapid diagnostic tests for Ebola virus disease in the midst of the epidemic itself. So one um, on the top left here uh, was a point of care uh, rapid antigen test, and the other um, was an automated molecular test using the um, gene expert system by Cepid, uh, which um, as many of you may know is frequently used to diagnose TB and other diseases. Um, both rapid tests demonstrated high sensitivity and high specificity in comparison to lab-based RT-PCR tests that were kind of more conventionally used to diagnose Ebola. And, you know, in this case, while the studies were conducted a bit too late into the outbreak to have had kind of widespread adoption outside of the research protocol, um, they've certainly paid, paved the way for um, much faster detection of cases and initiation of therapy in future epidemics. Um, so, for example, in the, the DRC, the gene expert test has since been adopted as um, the primary diagnostic, uh, the first diagnostic that's used for Ebola um, or suspected cases of Ebola. And it's likely to be used, of course, in the recent outbreak in Guinea now as well. Um, so, I mean, you know, just from the DRC example, it's, it, it was evident that it reduced turnaround times to just hours um, rather than days or even weeks um, and allowed for, uh, therefore, you know, much prompter initiation of treatment and isolation, and now also vaccination and tracing of contacts um, of those who test positive. So, and, you know, of course, now we also have kind of specific thera therapeutics for Ebola. Um, and their utility as well depends on prompt testing. Um, so you know, there was a clinical trial that was conducted uh, during the epidemic um, in DRC that started in 2018. Um, and there were you know, two monoclonal uh, antibody-based uh, therapies that were found to be very effective in reducing mortality, but especially so among patients who were diagnosed and treated early um, while, while their viral loads were still low. Uh, mortality, I think, was um, somewhere around 10% in this subset of patients. Um, you know, a huge improvement compared to the 70% figures that we saw um, in West Africa. Um, now, of course, not all patients had access to prompt diagnosis and, and treatment, but I think what this, what this example of Ebola shows is that 
rapid testing, uh, whether for Ebola or for COVID, if linked to an equity plan and a preferential option for those who are at greatest risk of infection and illness um, can just play an enormous role in reducing health inequities. To me, what's being advocated in this paper and by this entire group um, is a commitment to equity. And that means, again, trying to um, push forward a much more imaginative um, idea of what's possible. Um, you know, I think there's been a lot of kind of containment um, nihilism in this country uh, where, you know, people have kind of just given up on, on what's needed to stop the epidemic and, you know, have kind of just counted on the vaccine to um, ultimately be our, our savior. Um, and, you know, at this point, obviously we've had a, a fairly mediocre rollout of the vaccine so far. Um, and at the same time, you know, as many people on this, in this group have, have said, um, you know, it still remains to be seen, you know, how much, you know, what level of coverage we'll obtain. And so um, in the meantime, a failure to act and, and to implement this, um, you know, this uh, strategy of rapid testing at, at scale um, will unfortunately mean many more lives. Um, so just briefly on PIH's uh, COVID work. So, you know, we have recently begun working in both, um, you know, in, in all of our sites around the world, but also more substantially here in the US. Uh, in um, April of 2020, we were invited by um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to um, stand up the uh, Massachusetts Community uh, Tracing Collaborative for COVID-19, which is a contact tracing program, um, where we kind of drew on lessons after we learned from Haiti, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, Liberia, elsewhere, um, to, uh, you know, fighting other epidemics to build out this tracing program and at the same time, try to build care and accompaniment into it. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people think of tracing as a surveillance strategy, um, but we've tried to really frame it as one of care um, in that, you know, you, you may trace a contact, but in, in order to permit, for example, safe isolation, if you're a, if you're a case or a quarantine, if you're a contact, um, you know, you may need uh, resources, you might need social support, you may need food, um, you may need housing support, and so this has been a, a pillar of PIH's approach. Now that said, you know, there's, uh, you know, uh, tracing is, is so reliant on um, prompt and, you know, accurate testing. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that there's just a, a massive need and a massive area uh, in which um, the rollout of rapid tests um, at, at a much larger scale can actually amplify um, the utility of something like contact tracing. Um, and so again, just, just, I just wanna express my admiration. Um, PIH actually from the start has elevated both PCR testing uh, for clinical diagnosis, as well as rapid testing for the reasons that have been mentioned. Um, and you know, very early in the epidemic, uh, our leadership uh, was, was committed to um, procuring hundreds of thousands of, um, of rapid diagnostic tests, including antigen and antibody tests for use in eight countries uh, around the world. Um, and, you know, at, uh, you know, I think it's also important to remember that, you know, in a, in a lot of the countries in which we work, there's maybe only one national um, laboratory um, in the entire country that could do a PCR test. Um, and that was certainly true um, at the beginning of this outbreak and or pandemic and, and still true in many places. And so um, it was clear that we would have to integrate other strategies in order to get a, a um, kind of a handle on what was going on, trying to even start to understand the epidemiology of the virus in, in places where it just hadn't been detected before. Um, so I've linked here, for example, a, um, a COVID triage and screening um, diagram uh, that, you know, I think to, um, to the delight of people in this group, uh, you know, endorses rapid antigen testing. Um, and, you know, our, our laboratory colleagues led by um, Daniel Rosco, Nadia Correa, Megan Striplin, and our network around the entire world um, has really kind of uh, elevated the importance of both um, support for RT-PCR for national laboratories and, uh, you know, use of rapid diagnostic tests um, in more kind of community and, and uh, clinic-based settings. Um, so, um, so yeah, I just want to close by saying, you know, what, what we faced here is a failure of imagination, and that's the biggest threat to health equity. 
Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, the work being advanced in this paper and by this group, um, you know, if, if it's, um, you know, adoptive at scale, um, it can really have an enormous impact, not only in uh, containing the epidemic, but also uh, starting to close a lot of these health disparities um, that, that the pandemic has unveiled. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ishan. That was that was just so illuminating, and we really appreciate you taking time away from from your valuable work at, with Partners in Health to spend some time with us to share your your research and your your experience. So thank you so much. Um, so that was a perfect segue into our commentary. Um, so I, I just up, have up here uh, the the folks who are named authors. We also one of the authors you'll notice is the Rapid Test Working Group, which represents an international collaboration. Of, of, of numerous highly highly intelligent, highly skilled, um, highly interesting and wonderful people that we all work with on these efforts. So I just wanted to bring attention to the fact that this work would not have been possible without this uh, incredible team run at Rapid Test that was started by Chris Sade um, and uh, Dr. Michael Minna and, and other folks who were involved with that. So thank you, our deepest thanks for all of your support in making um, you know, our efforts to make progress possible together. So with that, um, we have, uh, you know, uh, just the, some of the, the authors are represented with the little pins on the map, um, just to give you an idea that this collaboration that we're about to tell you about spans um, continents. So joining us here from across the world are two of our collaborators on this paper. We have Dr. Louise Kenny from the University of Liverpool and Mr. Desmond Alumnoa from the Green Africa Youth Organization. Hi Sherry and hi all and thank you so much for the very kind invitation to join today. Um, so hello from England um, and from Liverpool where we have been conducting I think what is now uh, one of the largest uh, cohort studies of rapid antigen testing um, that we've seen during this pandemic. We've now tested over 600,000 residents uh, in our city with rapid antigen tests um, and it's been an incredibly useful public health intervention. Uh, in the fight against COVID-19. And I'd just like to share three very quick thoughts um, about what we've learned through this exercise. Firstly, um, COVID is not a disease of equals, certainly in our city, in Liverpool. Um, it has exaggerated ingrained health inequalities, which is why I'm so passionate about the topic of this paper. Um, secondly, I think the phrase global village has never been uh, more true. Um, we are absolutely all, this, all in this together. And thirdly, uh, no one will be safe until we're all safe. So it's an absolute pleasure to be part of this global effort and um, to make antigen, rapid antigen testing free and available to all. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, we at Green Africa Youth Organization um, are glad to participate in this writing uh, since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Ghana and other parts of Africa where we've been working. We've been supporting communities and helping to overcome the idea of stigmatization and to improve, the, to encourage testing at the, the community level and also at the national level. We've been leveraging on the power of young academicians to broker knowledge at the community levels to, to support in eliminating COVID-19. And we stand uh, with all the points that have being raised in this paper and uh, we hope that together we will be able to to clamp down the pandemic in uh, in no time thank you thank you so much mr alugnoa so with that um we wanted to present uh, our paper and so the four of us who are going to be presenting uh are uh mo johnson leon uh, maureen uh who goes by mo uh, from Texas. Uh, I am uh, based in Boston right now and originally I'm from Florida. Um, and we also have our, our two outstanding research assistants uh, from Simmons University, Brianna DeHarnas and Emily Costanza. So we will be uh, sharing some highlights from our commentary with you. So with that, Mo, would you like to give us our overview? Awesome. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm, I go by Mo, um, and uh, as Sherry mentioned, I'm a researcher right now at the University of Texas Austin, focusing on uh, data equity work. Um, I just want to reemphasize that something that has been brought up throughout the presentation is that this was a highly uh, collaborative work. Um, 
we've heard from any of the people that participated. So when we talk about kind of the four main points in uh, this paper, which I think will appear on the screen shortly, um, that's really four main points that came from an executive summary that we, pub we that will be published next week that came from uh, a multi-page supplementary documents with a lot of uh, resources and um, case studies. And really, I want to also highlight all the collaborators came from a breadth of having field experience and research experience, being um, nurses at schools or researchers at universities, um, people with a variety of backgrounds. And I think this is just really important because the other things that we're all living through this pandemic as well. So what we're talking about are also kind of strategies that we wish to deploy within our own communities and families. So the main four points uh, with hopefully they give a little bit of hope, a little bit of imagination of what could be possible once we might have more access to rapid antigen testing is that this frequent rapid testing uniquely complements all the other infection prevention, mitigation strategies that we've been doing the entire pandemic. It's an additional tool. Also through modeling work and then other analysis, comparing these widespread rapid antigen testing to targeted and frequent molecular testing is a false equivalency that leads to harm. Um, you really um, want to have as much frequent testing as possible and just comparing them one for one um, really doesn't make sense as a testing strategy in pandemic response work. Also universal access to these uh, low cost, free, fast, rapid test is critical to have follow up and support in order to promote equity and reduce harm. At the end, we'll talk a lot from other uh, throughout the entire kind of uh, public health field. Self-testing has been shown to be effective for other diseases. And so we're also advocating for that here. And each of us will we'll talk a little bit more about each point. Thank you, Mo. Great, so um, this should look familiar for this first point, which is basically the Swiss cheese model. And um, the idea is that any individual intervention on its own is not perfect. And uh, we need all of the interventions together to be able to protect people, especially on a population level. And um, if you note here at the bottom, we have um, a little mouse <laughs> that just happened to be in the original illustration that illustrates how important, and the mouse agrees, uh, testing is and, uh, and tracing. And so that's, that's basically what we're trying to say here, that when we have rapid tests, it really helps us uh, build up that capacity that's really important in this model to protect people. So uh, for our second point here, uh, Dr. Minna, I'm not sure if you wanted to, to say something as well. Sure, I'll, I'll just uh, describe briefly. So um, there's been a lot of confusion about the different types of tests. For example, PCR tests, which are very, very high analytical sensitivity, but uh, anyone who's gotten a PCR test uh, out in the sort of regular world, outside of the, the wealthy academic institutions, uh, has potentially seen that these tests sometimes take multiple days to return and, and simply aren't used, uh, they can't be used daily for the most part, uh, nor even multi, you know, two or three times a week would be a very huge burden to place on PCR testing. So, um, but when we look at the infection dynamics or the kinetics of the virus within a person, it turns out uh, that uh, the analytical sensitivity of the test, as I mentioned earlier, is not nearly as important as the frequency with which you can test people. And so this is just a, a diagram. This comes from a, a paper we published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which discusses uh, the frequency issue and, and frequency versus sensitivity. And so what this is showing is the viral kinetics within an individual uh, and uh, essentially it shows that if you're testing frequently with a lower analytical sensitivity test, but the, the very, by, by the nature of testing frequently, you're more likely, not less, to catch people when they are infectious. And that's because it's all about the frequency. Now, what, what I'm showing on the y-axis here is the viral load inside of a person after they get infected. Uh, once people become infected, no test will detect them for the first few days during this incubation period when the virus is at very, very low levels. But then PCR will start, if you, had, if you were able to be testing somebody you know, every moment of the day, you'd find that um, PCR will, will turn positive in a person. And then within about 15 hours, a rapid antigen test, a lower sensitivity test will also turn positive. And in fact, we just finished a, a large clinical study that, that is showing us, and we'll be trying to get that published soon. Uh, but essentially the window 
between which the high sensitivity and the low sensitivity test is very, very narrow. And so what this is really showing is it's almost never worth uh, reducing frequency in order to gain that improvement in terms of high analytical sensitivity. That's never the appropriate trade-off when you're trying to have a public health test. It's frequency above all else will allow you to find somebody when they're infectious. And then the infectious window is only about five days. So if you're not giving somebody a, re a result very quickly, uh, then it's not a, an effective test. If, it, if you have to wait three days to get your result, then even if you found somebody on day one of their infect, infection, um, you would be missing almost their whole transmissible window. And so while we continue to make assessments of these different tests based on their analytical sensitivity, what we really should be focusing on is the effectiveness of the test to help abrogate transmission. And when we uh, focus on the effectiveness of the test, then it turns out that low frequency PCR testing or low frequency testing using even a very high sensitivity test is not going to be effective. Because as, as you see in these two bottom dots here on the high analytical sensitivity um, metric, if you were just kind of doing this routinely, uh, you would be more likely to totally miss somebody's entire infectious period and then just catch them on their post-infectious period after they've actually been transmitting. So as a public health tool, these very high analytical sensitivity tests, unless they can be done very frequently and with very rapid results, are not going to be as effective as a lower analytical sensitivity, but much more higher sensitivity to catch infectious people when they're infecting type of test, and that's all based on the frequency. Uh, and, and tests like these that I'm holding in my hand here, these are the, the really inexpensive rapid antigen paper strip tests. They work just like a pregnancy test. You see two lines if you're positive and one line if you're negative. If these turn positive, it generally means you are infectious. And these tests have also been very, very high specificity, which has been another concern uh, out of thousands that we have now used, we still have yet to find one false positive. It's been 100% specificity over 5,000. And this actually fits with multiple uh, studies that have happened across the world. So, so while we continue to evaluate tests based, uh, these antigen tests based uh, against the PCR, uh, based on their analytical sensitivity alone, we really need to take the test program into account in order to best evaluate how appropriate one test is versus another for public health use. Now, this is an example that I like to show. Uh, if you have a school-based entrance screening program, for example, and you're trying to keep a school safe, uh, if you open up school and on the first day of school, as an example, you have uh, five students who walk into school who are infected or who show up at school on day one who are infectious. A PCR test, you could have a 100% sensitive PCR test, but it takes two days to return results. If you use that PCR test on day one, those five students will walk around for the next two days infectious until they get their PCR results back and then they'll be pulled out of, out of circulation. So it's 100% sensitive but you have 10 person days walking around infecting others. So that might lead, for example, to eight, you know, eight or so additional people infected and upwards of 20 or 25 people who have to go into two week quarantine. On the other hand, if you look on the bottom uh, of this figure, you have a rapid antigen testing program. You have the same five kids walk into school, but the test is only say 80% sensitive. Now we know that these tests actually achieve much greater than that when people are infectious, but we'll be conservative. If those five students are uh, tested with the antigen test along with everyone else going into school the first day, the lower sensitivity antigen test will catch four of those five. One of them will slip by because it's 20% of the individuals. So one person will slip by. They will walk around school. Ideally, they are low transmission that first day, which is why they were negative on the rapid test, they weren't quite at the, at the level needed to detect yet. But then maybe the second day they'll infect one or two people. But overall, this means that with the 80% rapid antigen test, because you were able to pull those first four out on day one, uh, you had only two person days of somebody walking around infectious versus 10. 
what does this mean? At the end of the end result of this means that despite using a less sensitive test, uh, the, because it gave fast results and immediately actionable results, you might end up with one or two individuals infected versus an additional eight. And you might end up with around five individuals having to get quarantined versus 20 or 25. So overall, what we see here is that the lower sensitivity test, because it's two person days versus 10 person days infectious walking around school, is the better public health test, even if it might not be the better medical diagnostic test for somebody. And so this is just a, a, a toy example to demonstrate. And actually, we now have real world examples of where this exact scenario has played out. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Minna. So for our third point, um, we're going to turn it over to Mo and Brianna to talk about universal access to free, frequent rapid testing and why this is crucial for promoting equity and why it's so important to have follow up and support as part of it. So it's not enough to just keep, give people these tests or use these tests. You really need to have the other piece where you're supporting people after they receive the results. So um, Mo, please go ahead. Yeah, so this third point is really focused on this kind of idea of accessibility, free, low cost, um, with ability to be able to follow up. Um, I'm speaking on this point a little bit, both as a researcher who focuses on uh, both rural populations and populations that have been made vulnerable through a variety of factors. Um, it's really been you know, very well documented that the ability to protect yourself in this pandemic has really functioned on a gradient of economic elitism um, and that there have been incredible racial and ethnic disparities um, in the US and then also um, many disparities abroad too. Um, so the test to be accessible um, universally, there have to be kind of support and follow up that has to be a, a low enough price for different communities to buy it. It has to be geographically available, whether you live in an urban or rural area, location matters. Can you go to a community center? Can you go to a, a hospital? Can you do it at home? Um, the ability to have agency is really important here, particularly with having to reach and support some of the communities that have been hardest hit. Um, on a personal level, I know people that are essential workers, uh, non-medical essential workers, that this entire pandemic haven't even had access to one type of test. And so they're going into work often blind despite doing their best to, to mask and social distance. Um, the other reason though, that testing can sometimes be a difficult decision for a worker to make. Um, if that a positive might indicate that they have to go home without support, without pay, that can be economically devastating for a whole host of people. Um, so when we talk about access to uh, frequent uh, and low cost rapid test, that piece, uh, that equity piece of providing support, of understanding the different needs of different populations, of really reaching out is a, a key part of this. Hi everyone, my name is Brianna. I'm a research assistant here at Simmons University in Boston. I'm just gonna touch on that last point just a little bit. Um, so even those who are able to get a COVID test, um, either it's a positive COVID test or you know you've had a positive COVID exposure, uh, many of these people are not able to isolate. Um, so I have seen this firsthand working at the Dimmick Center in Boston. And this is a community health organization that works primarily with low and middle income families in the Boston area. Um, and I help connect them with the various resources. And um, when I'm speaking with these families over the phone, uh, when it's regarding COVID, they have to make the decision between paying utility bills, feeding their families, paying rent, and also balancing that with keeping their coworkers safe. So it's really um, not just a simple yes or no answer for them. And so what we need to do is uh, support them in their self-isolation, providing resources for those in low and middle income communities to do what is best for the health of them, their families, and their coworkers. Thank you, Brianna and Mo. So we, we wanted to just also say briefly here a few words on why we chose our title of it's wrong not to test. Because at first glance, this might seem like a very negative statement to make, and maybe there's a positive way to frame it. And I promise we did think about this, but we were very deliberate with our choice. And so uh, the, our motivation for, uh, for using this title, and this is the premise of our 
work, this is a quote from our commentary, is that in the midst of a raging plague, it is inequitable and unethical not to deploy high quality rapid tests alongside existing public health interventions. And this is really our guiding uh, thought that, that, uh, that led us to uh, all the arguments and evidence that we pulled together for this commentary. So um, you might think that a statement like it's right always to test uh, might be equivalent to saying something like it's right to test. And actually these two statements are, are not actually the same thing. So the one on the right, it's right to test. It's basically what the World Health Organization has been telling us since last year, test, test, test. And I think you know, leading experts, a lot of people are on board with the idea that we need to test and there've been calls for this and there've been a lot of efforts to improve our testing infrastructure to meet demand. Um, it's a slightly different statement from it's always right to test, which actually um, is, is a little bit problematic in the sense that when we're talking about tests, we're really talking about people. And we really need to remember that at the end of the day, people have autonomy. They should be able to make choices about what's done with and about their bodies and their health. And so that is why we came to the conclusion that what we're really trying to say is that it's wrong not to test because the big problem right now is there are a lot of people in the world who don't have access to testing either because they're sort of um, cut out of, of existing testing infrastructure. They can't afford it, they can't access it. There are also very sad situations right now in the US and other places where people have free tests from the federal government but they're sitting in a closet or something because people are afraid to use them because they don't know how to use them or they're misinformed about what their utility might be. And so that is why we felt compelled to make the statements that we wanna make or that we've made in this commentary because we felt like it was something that wasn't being said as loudly as it should be right now. And so um, that actually is a great segue into our last point that's gonna be presented by uh, Emily Costanza, who's uh, one of our research assistants at Simmons along with Brianna. Thank you, Emily. Um, our fourth point is self-testing is effective. And I just wanna highlight a couple points of that. Uh, self-testing is already used very successfully in many areas of our lives already from at-home pregnancy tests to HIV self-tests. And these tests empower us to take action sooner rather than later. HIV self-testing in particular has shown to be one of the best ways to reach high-risk groups, obtain comparable results to that of healthcare workers, and has been projected to increase testing overall while increasing health gains. In addition, there is evidence from usability studies that show that self-testing at home would provide similar advantages. Self-testing would be an enormously valuable tool in the fight to prevent the spread of COVID-19, give us a chance for more immediate care, um, and protect others from getting COVID-19. Thank you, Emily. And this, this video is a screenshot from the National Health Service in the UK where they have um, a, a, a little video to help people with self-administered testing. So thank you very much, Emily. Thank you, everyone. Um, and so, because of our, our sort of altered timeline for today, you know, we always have to adapt to our situation. Um, I believe that uh, Dr. Kaplan is uh, not able to uh, join us for this part, but um, he has made uh, incredible contributions throughout this work. And we are so um, grateful to him for having the courage to speak up about the issues surrounding um, the, how equitable or inequitable, unfortunately, a lot of the vaccine efforts have been so far and how rapid testing can help fit in to uh, an overall strategy that can improve equity. So um, thank you, Dr. Kaplan, and uh, we will hopefully have a chance to um, include comments from you at, at a future event. And so um, uh, Brianna, Mo, uh, Emily, and I uh, were really uh, delighted to be able to share these thoughts with you. And um, if anyone wanted to say any closing words there? If not, we can uh, close the program. I think just to reiterate that so many of us are on the same page of hoping that uh, every single tool that is available can be deployed to end the pandemic or, or mitigate it and, and help us all. 
So just grateful for everybody being here and uh, looking forward to getting some of these tools deployed, to be totally honest, both personally and in my community and I think everybody else, so. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm just going to um, thank our, our sponsors and organizers and everyone for your, your patience, your grace, your belief that, that we were sharing something that hopefully is worth listening to. And uh, we thank you all because we know that the people in the audience today and the people who may be listening to this recording later, we know you're on the front lines doing a lot of really difficult work. And whether you use rapid testing yet or not, we hope that you'll consider it as a tool that might help you with what you're, you're trying to achieve if that's appropriate. So uh, we thank everyone. We thank our, our, our many supporters, uh, both named here and, and also uh, who, who may not be a, appear here. Um, and so with that, we are, we're, we're happy to, um, to entertain uh, questions from the audience, especially because we do have our live audience with us here. Um, so I think we're happy to, to take some questions, but uh, we know that because of our, our altered timeline, if, if there's any, you know, anyone who has to go or anything like that, uh, we thank you very much for having joined us. And uh, we're happy to, to continue with some questions if, if that's okay with everyone. And thank you also to all of our speakers and panelists for making time to be here today and for your, 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 your incredible work in preparations. Um, you know, we, I, I know we've made a lot of emphasis on the contributions of people with specific expertise in public health and, and science and implementation, um, but it takes all kinds of, of talent and passion and compassion to make these things work. So we're really grateful to all of our team members uh, for, for all of your efforts, including creative work and, and writing and editing and, and everything else that it takes to really make something effective work. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, everyone. So I think uh, that's all I wanted to say. I don't know, uh, Dr. Minna, if, if there's anything, any last word you or any of the other speakers wanted to say before we turn it over to some Q&A. Uh, no, I'm happy to take any questions or you know, just stay on. Thank you, Dr. Minna. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, um, so in that case, um, and we also, we still have our little, uh, we have the chat function if you're here live. There's also the, um, the, the, the form that you can use if you have any other sorts of comments or things for us. Go ahead, John. Hi, how's everyone doing? Thank you, uh, th thank thank you, you. for doing this. Um, thank you. So my question is, uh, I, I buy everything that uh, you guys have been talking about. I'm not a medical professional or anything. I'm, I'm, I'm like an actor filmmaker. And uh, I, as much as everyone, everyone else, wants to uh, get some sort of return to normalcy. I think um, I'm wondering about messaging. Um, is there any sort of plan to get the message out? Uh, maybe like, you know, I know this sounds kind of tacky, but like go like the A-list celebrity route, you know, get like George Clooney or Lady Gaga to talk about. And I know that sounds like very like optimistic, but I, I, I think it's worth trying because it, it's, it's a shame that like none of my friends know anything about rapid testing. And, and if I talk to them about it, they keep falling back on this, you know, well, it's not as accurate, um, you know, um, and they don't actually like sit down and listen to the arguments. But if you have something where it reaches critical mass, like something on, on the level of like a Al Gore's inconvenient truth, where like it becomes a household name, everyone talks about it and it becomes difficult to, uh, difficult to ignore. So I was just wondering uh, what your thoughts are about that. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. That's a fantastic idea. I have some thoughts, but Dr. Minna, if you have any thoughts on that, please go for it. Well, I, I do think, um, you know, one thing I've discussed a lot is one of the major tools that we generally, uh, I think, refrain from, unfortunately, in public health is, uh, is the power of of, uh, of messaging in the way that you're just describing. We should be getting the best marketing agencies to help get the right information and the correct messages to people. Uh, not just leave it to scientific papers, but we should be getting Coca-Cola's best you know, media agencies on board and marketing agencies, and we should be getting celebrities. I've actually attempted to reach out um, uh, over the over the the year to various uh, folks to try to get that type of uh, support with mild success at various times, but uh, I think it's a great idea, and I think um, many of us uh, who have been sort of leading this charge to try to write the record around the most effective uses of of very powerful public health tools, uh, we would welcome the opportunity to to essentially engage and and get. Uh, you know, additional spokespeople that are potentially, you know, more 
relatable or, or uh, come with a, a certain level of trust for the average uh, individual in society. Absolutely, Dr. Minna. And actually, we do have supporters. So, you know, when you turn on the TV and you see CNN and people aren't wearing masks, it's not because they're, they're breaking the rules. It's because they have really sophisticated testing systems in place, often with rapid testing. Same thing for the NFL. If you watched the Super Bowl last weekend, congratulations, everyone who competed in that. Um, you know, basically, there are, there are these examples of people in government, Hollywood, um, the sports teams using rapid tests already. And, um, and this is why we're trying to emphasize this point about equity, that if we have a lot of places where it's already happening successfully, typically places that have are more highly resourced, that this should be open to everyone. And we really do need every, you know, every celebrity who wants to talk about this um, to, to put their face out there so that people understand what's going on. I also wanted to throw out there that I know that there are efforts from other organizations like the COVID Collaborative to try to bring um, awareness to the fact that there actually is a lot of public support right now for rapid testing. And uh, they will be releasing some information soon about that. That um, I, it, I, my understanding is that there's gonna be something released next week. And so I think that you all should, should stay tuned for that because I think it's really gonna help um, put a lot more um, uh, substance to this idea that people are supportive of rapid testing and that they do wanna do this. But right now we just don't have the tools in place and the programs in place to, to do it as well as we could be doing it right now. Thank you. Um, I, so I think um, because we have several people who raised their hands, uh, can, Carrie, can you go next? And then I think I had seen uh, Jared, then Irene and Theo. So thank you. So I'm gonna, thank you for that question, John. So Carrie, please go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Carrie Kultzer and uh, I'm in Cambridge and I own a restaurant and we've been very, very keen on trying to get some sort of testing program uh, here in our workplace and then subsequently, hopefully with, uh, with guests. Um, and, you know, just on a practical level, we've been doing um, pooled testing twice a week for our staff and that's really reassuring. Um, and that was something that was made possible by CIC Health to do a pilot beta program with pooled testing. Anyway, that set aside, I've been thinking very long and hard about the practicality of genuinely like doing rapid testing to do the general public through say a business like mine. And I just wanted to know in the modeling, like the role of contact tracing in my, the way I understand it um, kind of becomes sort of not as meaningful in screening, but does that, is that real? Uh, is that true? Is there any kind of protocol for contact tracing that one would have to do to do screening? You know, and then does that change depending on the community spread and what the R not is? That's really, it's a really a very practical, very like real, real world question, but I appreciate any thoughts. And, and thank you. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Minna. I was going to just thank Carrie because uh, Grendel's Den in Harvard Square is actually our official food and beverage sponsor for this particular event. So I wanted to thank you very much for your support. And so Dr. Minna, please go ahead with your thoughts on the question. Um, the idea of contact tracing. Uh, so contact tracing is a very powerful and useful uh, approach to tackling this. Um, there's, a, there's a few answers to the question. On the one hand, uh, if we could get tests out to uh, for example, enough people, uh, then contact tracing almost becomes moot. The whole, one of the major roles of contact tracing is to just let people know that they may have been exposed so that they go and test. So if they're already testing anyway, then essentially the, the whole notion of contact tracing starts to fall away. It's a whole different paradigm. Uh, but if you are going to be contact tracing, uh, I would say that the, the use of, of frequent and rapid tests will make it more effective and the speed at which you're getting a result back can actually allow you to act on the results in a time frame that actually means anything and, uh, and makes sense. And so uh, whether it needs to change, I would say that one of the most important things is not to, there have been a lot of people who have said that we can't have tests until we can report them, you know, until somehow this little gadget gets a Bluetooth device, you know, but then we end up with, with a thing like the Illum test which has Bluetooth in it and reports, but it's 50, or it's, it's expensive and can't scale very high. So these, these little paper strip tests with no um, electronics, uh, just because they can be, you know, I would like to see reporting and contact tracing structures be set up and make it voluntary so that somebody can do a single click, but that alone shouldn't be a reason not to roll these out. Uh, because I, if I were a, a business or if I were anyone in society, I'd rather more people know that they are infected rather than 
just pretend like we don't know and and because we can't do the contact tracing. So that's been this real battle is trying to get that point across that um, that while it's great to have reporting set up, it's great to have contact tracing set up. Uh, if we're not doing those, it doesn't mean the cases aren't happening and people aren't going to the hospital. So it's much more effective anyway in the meantime to really start getting these out. And if a restaurant or a facility wants to do its own internal contact tracing, uh, I think we're going to see a whole new ecosystem and landscape setting getting set up around that type of um, around that type of approach that small businesses uh, in the same way that large businesses are now doing it on their own, small businesses will also be able to. That's excellent, Dr. Minna. And actually that's that's happening in a few countries. For instance, Canada, I know there's there's a, a, a consortium of, of business leaders that are working on implementing rapid testing at, at a huge scale. So, um, and, and to your point about um, the issues related to reporting, that it's the same, the same arguments that were brought up about HIV, where you know, some of these reporting issues have been brought up over in pregnancy tests, same different issues where you know, they may be, maybe they don't get reported all the time, but don't you wanna have, an, have the ability to go to a store and buy a pregnancy test if you think you might be pregnant, even if you don't report every result? Um, so it's just, I think a lot of people have realized the utility in other contexts, but then when we, when we throw a new context in there, it seems like everyone just forgets everything that might apply from other cases. Um, and and another small point about reporting, you might've seen in the news that there are people, you know, like a drug ring, not a drug ring, but a, you know, a ring of, of con artists in France that was busted for giving people, uh, selling people negative COVID tests for to go on planes and things. And, and it, this reminds me of academic integrity issues in higher education. When you think about students cheating, you, you think it, it's very productive to think about why that's happening. And rather than just focus on how are we going to punish people who come up with these creative workarounds, how are we going to promote environments that prevent people from being forced to do things like that? So I think I'd love to see the conversation go in that direction so that we could have um, more of a focus on giving people the information to do the right thing and empowering people rather than the focus being on what could go wrong if people do what they're not supposed to be doing. So um, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm also looking at the time. I know there are a couple of people with their hands up. So I just like to ask if, um, if anyone is interested in getting involved with these efforts, um, we, you can go to rapidtest.org uh, and we can connect you with other folks. Uh, some other efforts that we're working on are trying to, to work with people on forming a community of practice, which is why in the registration information, we ask who of you have uh, been involved with that or might be interested in being involved with that because I think that's a piece that's really missing from the implementation side where we have a lot of people who are doing excellent work but because of these issues with connecting people to, to be able to do these things and some of this kind of um, misinformation or lack of lack of information and lack of federal control or federal leadership in, in a lot of cases that it's been really difficult to make progress so if you're interested in that please let us know and we'd, we'd be really happy to fill you in on those efforts. So, um, so with that, I, I do want to make sure that you know we've already taken more of your time than we expected today. Um, so I'm I'm happy to continue with answering questions or fielding things as long as people want to go. But I also want to be mindful of everyone's time. If anyone feels like they need to head out, please feel welcome to do that. I do this in class too. I basically say, you know, our class is over, but if you want to stay, we're here for as long as you want to stay. And I'm I'm happy to be here. And anyone else who wants to stay, please go ahead. But don't feel obligated. So uh, Dr. Min, I don't know if you want to have a comment before we just sort of hear anyone else who wants to be heard before we close the session. No, no, we can, we can just keep asking. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Minna. Thank you. Um, great. So I think um, we had Irene and, um, and or Jared, I forever got the order there, but if, if it's okay with you, Jared, could we hear Irene next? And then Jared, Theo, I think they're appearing kind of in, in somewhat of an order. So uh, Irene, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm just unmuting. First, thank you for a, a great event, uh, and thank you for getting this uh, commentary out. I think it's very good. Um, I want to mention that I live in outside London, in UK, and we are in a very fortunate uh, situation that the government actually do support uh, rapid mass testing, and it is being rolled out uh, as you every local authority who wants to have a rapid uh, test centre can set one up and it's free for all. Um, they're also now introducing uh, every company with more than 50 employees can uh, request a free test for their employees. So things are really moving in, in the right direction. 
in UK. And there have been some uh, in the academic world who've been very skeptical about the free test and or the rapid test and have raised a lot of questions on the sensitivity of the test. But I think people are gradually uh, realizing that uh, actually the tests are better than they uh, first initially thought. So I just want to mention it, it is going in the right direction. And also want to just make a small announcement if it's all right with you, Cherry. To Go ahead. That, uh, we are hosting a symposium uh, on the 4th of March. Uh, and the title is, Can We Test Ourselves Out of the COVID uh, Pandemic? Uh, where we will get uh, various speakers from around the world to come and talk to us about it. Uh, and uh, we will send you out more information about it, but please feel free to join us uh, and have the discussion and uh, see what we are saying. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you, thank you, Irene. Thank you, especially with the time difference. I know it's a lot later there here than here. So thank you very much. And I, was there, sorry, was there something in there that you, you wanted someone to react to or was it more of a comment? Yeah, I always, yeah, I mean, there's one thing because I participated in a, a webinar um, yesterday and many of the speakers, they felt that um, it was unethical to test unless you have an intervention ready. Uh, and I would like to hear uh, your view on, on that. I think one of the, the, the problematic issues there is that, um, you know, related to all the points we brought up in the commentary, you, there are very simple interventions that could be done. So for instance, if you know you have a positive antigen test, you can ask people to stay home. And many governments are doing that even without tests. They're locking people down and not letting them leave their houses. And so to say, well, you know, if you have a test and you're not sure exactly of the result, there's no intervention. I just don't understand how you can say that when we're already locking people down even without test results. So, um, you know, I, I think there, there could be much better interventions too as medical advances continue and everything. But I think it, and on baseline that there actually is a lot of actionable information that can come from rapid tests. And it's already been shown in, in a lot of different settings to be useful. So I, I would love to have a discussion with them to try to see if we can find some common ground to see if we can, um, you know, improve all of our understanding about doing the things as well as possible, as quickly as possible. So that's what I would say to that. <laughs> but Dr. Minna, I don't know uh, what thoughts you may have or anyone else who, who really feels like you need to speak to this very important point. Well, I think that the major point is um, to say that it's unethical to provide people a tool to know their infection status just because we're not also able to provide them, uh, you know, whatever might be payment to not go to work, for example. Obviously, the second is ideal. Uh, but the first, uh, that is a holdover from, again, thinking about this as a medical tool. In medicine, we say we, it's unethical to do an additional test if, if it's not going to change our practice as a physician for that patient um, at all. Uh, but for this, the, the, it, that's the wrong way to look at this. Just because you, can't, you aren't giving somebody money to uh, not be able to, to be able to stay home from work, doesn't mean that uh, them being empowered to know their status is not incredibly important. You know, people make small life changes, including continuing to go to work, but maybe eating lunch in their car instead of in the break room, maybe not going to church on Sunday. You know, there are so many ways that are uh, that don't require um, payment, uh, you know, to help people stay home from work, for example, uh, that people can utilize this this important information to keep their loved ones safe. So. I think that it's really a paternalistic view of, of these tests. And this is all about uh, empowering individuals to, to, there is nothing wrong with knowing if you have the virus inside you in a way that is transmissible. That should never be held up. It, it, absolutely. And, and to this point, and Mo, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words too about the fact that this idea that if you tell people that they're gonna hide it or they're gonna lie about their test result or they're gonna do whatever it is, we need to make sure that there's support so that if people get a positive test, it doesn't mean that they lose their jobs and they're afraid of that because that's a big fear right now for a lot of people that if they get a certain result, they won't be able to travel or they won't be able to see their family or so they'd rather not know even if they may be sick. And so that's, and, and because of the, the high level of asymptomatic spread, so people without symptoms 
you know, their, their numbers between 30 and 70% on that, but about half of the people, maybe more than half of people who have COVID and are contagious are, don't have symptoms. So it's so difficult for people to know, unless they have a rapid test, what their status is so that they can make good decisions. And that's really what's a lot of the evidence has been um, helping us make that point so much more clearly very recently. And so people who are making judgments on that based on evidence from a couple months ago or last year may, may still be making judges with, with lack of the most current information on that. And that's also what we wanna communicate. Yeah, I, I really think the word that hit the nail on the head um, is the paternalistic approach to also assuming that um, the only intervention can come from the same, very same institution or person providing the test. Um, I think, you know, people are going to try their best to stay healthy, to not infect other people. Again, repeating, of course, um, providing additional support, I think, like, is a great part of uh, the entire pandemic response, but conditioning that uh, testing on having that support too is robbing all of us of an additional tool, so. Absolutely, and, and, and the other point, uh, by the way, that came up in the seminar yesterday that I, I did wanna respond a little bit more directly to, at one point, one of the discussants was saying something along the lines of, well, in prison specifically, you know, there's there's kind of basically some. I'm sorry if I'm if I'm misquoting uh, or misinterpreting this, but something along the lines of, in prisons, you know, there are a population that's in the prison, and so we we don't need to focus on testing people in prisons. We should just focus on testing staff, and I found that very um, troubling because it, it it fundamentally misunderstands the situation of people who are incarcerated, and that we need to bring in the voices of the people whose decisions. These decisions, important decisions are being made on their behalf. And in the United States, where we have one of the largest prison populations in the world. We have, are not prioritizing our prisoners for vaccinations. We are not prioritizing them for testing. And in a lot of cases, there are tests sitting in a closet from the federal government in prisons that have not been used on the people they were meant to serve. And uh, it's an outrage. And I, I do hope that there can be more action on this because um, you know, prisons aren't just people locked away to rot. They are human beings sometimes being held without conviction in the United States and other places. And uh, they are a captive, very vulnerable population that deserves to have their voices heard. And I do hope that, that we're able to change that. And uh, we're happy, folks on our team are very involved in this. We know that there are also some efforts in the UK team and other places to make progress on this. But you know, just to, to set the record straight, people who are in prison have a right to visitors in a lot of cases, and the staff need to be protected as well. There, everybody needs to be protected there. And, and to just assume, while well, they're sitting in a prison and nothing's gonna happen to them because they're just sitting in a prison is, is, is I, I just think it really um, loses a lot of nuance in the actual situation. Sorry, thank you. So um, we still have uh, some, some comments. And, and um, so uh, Jared and, and Theo, then Mary, go ahead. So Jared, do you have a question? You're good? You're set? Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, bye. Uh, Theo, did you have a question? I would like to ask a question. I'd like to say thank you for having this opportunity because rapid testing is such an important way so that people know what their status is. But the problem is, if you don't test enough, you're not going to find people. But if you have no intervention, then you're not going to actually use a test in an appropriate way. So my concern is that when you say voluntary tests and you don't consider supported isolation and quarantine as a part of a triage of responses, you are pretty much not saying that we're going to help you and put you into some place where you're not going to spread the disease. We're going to support you and we're going to find your contacts and isolate them so that they can spread to others, even if they test negative, 
the tests aren't fully reliable and it needs to be a public health and government assistance and decision on that. Absolutely. And that's why we're saying that governments should assist people with isolation and to supported isolation, compassionate isolation and financial support so that people aren't losing their jobs or, you know, having having, uh, you know, all the consequences that we've been seeing throughout the pandemic. So we and, we totally agree that, that that's absolutely necessary. What we're and, saying, though. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And there's one more thing, just treating it as a voluntary thing and how you, because the other part is that this is an airborne pandemic, people, you can spread it if you're not wearing, for example, an N95 respirator and you're nearby for just a short period, you can spread it quite easily. So that's really important. Yes. And it's also, absolutely, we agree with everything you're saying. And the fact that we absolutely need to have community buy-in, which has been a big part of the really successful programs that we've seen in Nova Scotia, Liverpool, other places. So I think what we're trying to say is that all of these considerations are important and ideally they should be carried out with voluntary you know, com uh, compliance so that you can have as much uptake as possible without resorting to forcing people to test, which would be an absolutely last resort that I don't think any of us are saying should be a first line when we haven't tried everything else. Um, thank you, Theo. They, they, thank you for making those remarks. Uh, or Dr. Min, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else on that point before we, we try to um, have the other folks ask. Yeah, no, I, I, fully, I fully agree with it. And um, I, I think it's extremely important to take into consideration. Thank you, Dr. Minna. Um, so Mary, then Alan, please um, go ahead, Mary. Um, yeah, I think there are two points that generally seem to get lost in, in these discussions um, and in criticisms of the rapid tests. And I know it's things that Michael has brought up many, many times, but they still seem to get lost in the trying to simplify everything. And that's the fact that um, there are many ways that the rapid test can be used, and it could be up to the choice of the individual how they're used. Um, for example, if, if they want to use it for their, <clears throat> their own purposes to know if it's safe to visit their grandparents, or if they want to connect with public health so that they could um, use it to, to travel or to go to a restaurant. Um, and and this, the second thing is the, um, I hardly ever hear um, any talk of the confirmatory tests. And that's crucially important when these tests are criticized for the um, false um, negatives. And I, so, I mean, and, and I, I, but I thought the I the webinar was was interesting the BMJ, because um, Pedro, you know, from Oxford was was really good I thought, and um, he seemed to have convinced the moderator Phil Hammond, which was interesting. <laughs> so that's all. Thank, oh thank yes, you. actually, what, one one other thing because you know I, I work in emerging infectious diseases, and I'm concentrating a lot on the Ebola outbreak now in, in the DRC and there I, I can see a huge need for the rapid antigen test because I mean there's COVID circulating and people don't want to go out they don't want to get exposed but also for Ebola because there's you know the question of whether it's present in semen and you know that's something that could be maybe tested self-tested mm -hmm. so that's it those, those are great points, Mary. Thank you. And thank you for your support of the commentary as well and all of your, your, your efforts to inform us about what's going on. <laughs> thank you, Mary. And, and Dr. Min, I don't know if you wanted to comment on any of that, especially confirmatory testing. I know that's a point you've responded to a lot. And it is something that we address in the longer paper. We agree with you. It's very important to make that available as quickly as possible as well, because that's one of the problems, for instance, with pool testing, which is a very important strategy, especially in low prevalence settings. Uh, like schools, for instance, is, is a place where it could work re reasonably well. But the big problem is if you have a pool that's positive, then you have to go back and test everyone in that pool. And that creates a delay if you don't have access to something like rapid testing. So I think that's one of the, the, the challenges that complicates that strategy. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Mina. 
Uh, well, I think uh, very in, in brief, uh, uh, confirmatory testing of negatives uh, in a frequent rapid antigen testing program, we've heard people say, and that's even been policy, that an antigen test or a rapid test, whatever kind it might be, might need confirmatory testing if it's negative. That, that wholly misses the point. If we could confirm every negative <laughs> result, then we would, um, we would not be having this discussion. Um, but confirmatory testing of the positives is uh, extre extremely important. Although tests like this, like the ANOVA test, for example, which has been widely used in the UK, we just finished a large trial of over 5,000 tests. We have still yet to get a single false positive, which is better, performing much better than the PCR tests. So they're actually, they've come a long way from the initial like BD Veritor and Sophia Quidel tests and such um, in terms of false positives. But nevertheless, you could have two rapid tests. These are two different companies. They look the same. You get a positive on this one, you take a second one eight hours later, and it could even be the exact same company. That alone will get false positives to exceedingly, exceedingly low numbers uh, that, that it really makes it almost moot. And, and then you can test yourself 24 hours later. If you're negative 24 hours later, uh, and then you're negative a day after that, then it's not a, the ramifications of a false positive are actually quite limited when you have rapid tests because you can repeatedly test. And if you find that you're negative two days in a row, then you go back about your business and you assume it was false positive. Um, but it, again, the newer versions like the Innova and Binex now and, and PanBio are very, very low false positive rate, especially if you do two in a row anytime you get a positive. Thank you, Dr. Minna. And, and there's also the possibility of, you know, especially for people who are skeptical about that, which I believe, I believe what you're saying, Dr. Minna, because of the research you have behind it. I apologize for the background noise. Um, but one, one other idea is there are some rapid tests that are portable. They're, they're quick, they're molecular tests, but it, there's also a possibility you could have um, strategically placed, uh, you know, especially for communities that may not have access to rapid uh, PCR turnaround testing like you would in, a, in an inpatient hospital setting, for instance, where you can turn those results around very quickly, that you might be able to use a combination of uh, rapid confirmatory antigen tests and also some of these other technologies that are coming out that can do molecular tests very quickly as well in, in settings that don't require a lab. So, um, great, thank you. Uh, so uh, Jared, I think you um, had meant to say something. Awesome, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Awesome, thanks guys. Thanks uh, Dr. Minow, we really appreciate it. Uh, with all the work you've done, it's it's been truly phenomenal. And uh, RapidTest.org, the way you guys push the, push the message is uh, is phenomenal. So just a quick background: um, I own a uh, medical device class one and two uh, distribution company, as well as an in vitro diagnostics company. So we've collected all of our data uh, in a, in our two New Jersey testing sites uh, for POC, and we're currently collecting uh, for OTC. But as you know, the OTC EUA is very timely, right? So I put a timeline. I'm, I'm hoping in you know, a couple months we can wrap that up, but fingers crossed. Um, and I have cystic fibrosis. I was diagnosed at birth. So, you know, I've, I've been tasked to do, you know, about four treatments a day on my own, as well as, you know, IV treatments that I perform on myself. And, you know, when you look at, you know, a risk reward standpoint, when I'm in the hospital, it's just a five minute teaching by a nurse to tell me how to administer an IV, right? So when I look at that and I go, okay, I go home, I do it on myself, you know, no problems. And then I look at, well, where, why is there so much pushback on telling people to swab their nose? It, it, it just, it, it doesn't make sense to me, right? So <clears throat> when we touched on marketing, I, it's a great point. I would love to help. We we do have uh, we do have funds allocated to marketing, so if anyone uh, wants to collaborate on that, I'm I'm free to do so. As well as we do have plenty of kits that I'd love to to give for free for any studies anyone wants to run. That would be awesome. So I'll I'll, I'll reach out to you guys directly. But I guess my question is really uh, I know I know Dr. Minna has has been in the most um, engaged with the new administration. So I wonder if you could tell us if, if there's any, any kind of updates in terms of how they feel about this initiative. I, I know they've scaled up the alums, but you know, I think uh, the numbers on those are still not enough to make a, a serious dent in, in the transmission, right? I think 
you're looking at what 7 million devices and then hopefully by the summer um you know 10 to 20 million more it's still not enough right so i'm just wondering where is the biggest pushback from the administration administration is it the the reporting aspect is it the uh you know is it the aspect of um you know, uh, a, a video, like a, a teleconference like Abbott, or, or what, what is the biggest pushback that the government is, is kind of giving you to, to prevent these from being rolled out? Um, well, this, this current administration isn't giving pushback. I think they're looking for solutions and they're trying to find them. Uh, you know, of course, I've been a, a bit critical about the decision surrounding Illum. Um, my expectation is that was uh, in the works for a while prior to this new administration. I mean, it's a good test. It's just not a public health test. You know, this is a very good clinical mm -hmm. test, but again, it's not a public health one. Um, uh, I think that they're looking at all their options. They're trying to figure out what tests are really available and can scale today. There's only a few companies that can really scale to the in the way that would would lead us down the road of having you know 30 million a day. But com combined, many companies uh, together will would would enable that. And I think they're starting to take that very seriously. I, I think that the early announcements of uh, Illum and then the six additional manufacturers that they were referring to, those are, uh, I think, them putting their cards on the table and saying we are interested in really in really um, surround, creating policies surrounding these tests. And uh, they are uh, they are working hard to figure out the right approaches at the moment. Awesome. <clears throat> yes. and and. Thank you very much, Jared. And, and to your point about uh, connecting manufacturers of high quality tests with um, you know, people who want to do testing right now, like we heard earlier from, from Carrie at Grendel's Den, you know, there are a lot of businesses that, that, that want to do it right and want to do it as well as possible. And uh, so we're working in, in this idea of the community of practice I mentioned earlier to try to see how we can help you know, support efforts that may already be happening to do that or to help, help promote that in a productive way. So we're really looking forward to that. The other effort that our group is working on that, that kind of speaks to one of the points you raised is the, the one of the big problems that, that Dr. Minna and others have talked about is the fact that the FDA regulates and approves rapid tests as, they, as though they are medical devices for medical diagnostic testing. And so we need to continue to promote efforts to have pathways specifically for public health diagnostics. And in particular, to be able to have high quality tests that can be made by multiple manufacturers that also that we can use um, the, you know, the, the, the powers of the federal government to promote the, 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 the creation and generation of generic tests, for instance, it, because of the public health emergency, work with manufacturers to get those licensing agreements in place. And so one of the efforts we're working on is working on these different levers that we have for promoting competition so that it's not just the big companies that were the early entrants that can monopolize the market and set the prices you know, as they wish, um, that we can actually have multiple entrants to the market as <clears throat> of, of high quality tests as possible so that we can try to promote you know rapid action as quickly as possible um i do i just to let you know sure I, i'm gonna yeah. hop off right now but no, no problem thank you thank you so much for the thank you thank you thank you so thank much you. dr minna thank you so much and um so thank you very much, everyone. And again, <clears throat> everyone who has to go, please go ahead. Um, I know that we, we, we run really late, but I think it sounds like people still wanna speak and I'm happy to stay as long as people want to. But for anyone who has to go, please go ahead. We'll make uh, at, at, at least the, the general part of the recording and possibly the Q&A available later. We'll just check with everyone who contributed to make sure that's okay. But um, I'm happy to continue helping with this. And also whoever's still here who wants to help answer questions, just um, like, you know, give us a sign so that we can do that. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, Alan, I think you were next and Megan and then Ken. And um, so let's go ahead. So Alan, go ahead. Thank you very much, Sherry. Great job. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Sherry, Dr. Minna, Mo, Chris, Shauna, everyone at Rapid Test Answer Network. You guys advocate network. You guys do a great, amazing volunteer group. I want to echo John Wu's celebrity messaging. We need trust symbols for celebrities like Dr. Sanjay Gupta to start. I know he's interviewed Minna uh, several times and you know we just need to get somebody on board like that or several people in that. But I have two questions. 
and you kind of started going into that in terms of FDA regulatory path, is, is there any update or any place to stay just in general, you know, getting out of the diagnostic and into the public health type of angle and who we can pressure and lobby at the FDA? And so that's a great question. I know that there are different people working on that. So I don't know if anyone who's still on the call, um, uh, let me just see who we have. Because I think here. without that, we're, we're pretty much toast. I mean, we can get all the money and all the want in the world, but without it, we're, I mean, that, that's it. And my next question, you know, while somebody's ramping up to it, it might be related. You know, there, if we're gonna test twice a week, half the population, that's like over a billion tests a month, right? So there are 50 rapid test manufacturers around the world with CE marks. That's the um, you know, certification in Europe and other areas that you know, may not exceed FDA, but are not accepted in the USA. Now, if you have FDA approval, you can certainly use that pretty much around the world. But if you have a CE mark, you can only use it in certain countries uh, mm -hmm. other than the US. Is there any thoughts of FDA accepting the CE mark as an EUA equivalent? Is anybody aware of that? So I think uh, th that's a great point, Alan. I think we're gonna, we're, it's something that has br been brought up before in the team, both the, the points of, you know, what what sort of uh, guidance can be shared with the administration to help make sure that the FDA is um, responsive to some of these needs that are still unmet. And yes. also this point about the, um, uh, the CE mark and, and whether there's some pathway for helping expedite approvals based on it. So I think it's just something we're actually we're, we're actively um, looking at. I think Sarah might have some comments, but I know that because I I know that we we have some folks who are um, you know we've gone a, a, an hour over at this point. So uh, and because we started a bit late and everything, so I do want to try to wrap up so that people don't feel like they have to be compelled to stay, um, if, especially because I know folks need to move on to other things. So Sarah, go ahead, and then we have um, oh, our it, last it was just, people. It, go ahead. it might have, it it would be kind of maybe partially answer Alan's questions, but it does not have to be now. I can talk about it with him later if there's other people who have questions that don't normally get addressed. Okay, well, Sarah, I think because of all the interest that we have, I think we should definitely have a follow-up conversation. So I think if okay. anyone, you know, you have that, the form, I don't know if anyone wants to put in the chat, the, the form with the, the, to ask the questions for our team. So if anyone has thoughts on that, that we can follow up on later, please feel free to use the form for that, the tinyurl.com slash wrong not to test so that we can, uh, you, we can have that in the conversation. Thank you, Alan, for putting that out there. And thank you. Thank you for your help with the event and everything too, because uh, Alan and, and Sarah and, and others here, uh, including John Frankel and, and some other folks uh, were, were all very involved in the planning. So we really appreciate your help and feedback. And Dr. Phoebe Olava is there as well. Um, and so uh, so let's, let's have our last couple of comments and let's try to wrap up by four, hopefully, 4 p.m. EST if that's possible. But. Again, I'm happy, I'll turn off the recording at that point and I'm happy to talk to whoever still wants to talk. So thanks. Okay, um, I think we were Megan and then uh, Ken. Go ahead, Megan, if you still want to speak. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, first of all, I just wanna thank everyone. Um, thank you for all your efforts and um, putting this whole thing together and uh, being a real, um, supporter of uh, rapid testing. Um, I'm, my question is, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, any room for um, kind of a grassroots public movement um, in, in the form of a petition or something like that for the public to have a voice to kind of um, speak to legislators en masse um, and kind of let, let the public position known. I can't, I can't think of a single person who'd be opposed to rapid testing. I mean, just um, the way it would change our lives would be phenomenal. Absolutely, Megan. Thank you for that comment because it's also something we've thought a lot about and uh, we've, we've been working on strategies for. And actually, if Sarah wanted to say, uh, and Sarah, uh, who, who had spoken a few seconds ago, um, is, is actually very involved with other organizations that are also very, you know, big uh, supporters of getting grassroots awareness and grassroots mobilization to help you know, expedite these efforts. So Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words yeah. on that. But I mean, go ahead. I, I, I think that the, the main thing that's going to happen with the rapid test is you can't just wait for, for the top down. Like one of the best ways to get it out there is to just start doing it. So, and this comes to the difference between like surveillance testing versus other types of testing. But surveillance testing, it does not require FDA, does not require EUA, does not require CLIA, doesn't require anything. You can set up a surveillance testing in your neighborhood, for example, and, and do it. 
And you know what? The next neighborhood over, they're going to see it's happening and they're going to want to do it. And then the next neighborhood and then the city. And then they'll start putting pressure on the local government to provide funding for this. And they'll put pressure on that. You know, they're like, it's going to be something that really does just spread like group to group, neighborhood to neighborhood, school to school. And you really can start doing it now. Like there, there's a misconception. I mean, and I realize it's basically people don't really, everyone hears rapid test and they kind of think just one thing, but, but there's a bunch of different types and, and, when you do it a certain way, like you really don't have to wait for the app test or anything. Uh, I don't want to mislead guess, people with that. So I, I, yeah. But I think the right. grassroots is is 100% the way to do it. And if you know, like community groups, if you know things that want to start doing it, like we can help get that set up. Um, I thought one of the trouble was that the test, the tests themselves were not available because of the FDA approval process. And so I was, I was more thinking of uh, putting some pressure on legislators to make another pathway available to to make these tests available. Yeah, so they are they are oh, working on that. Oh, sorry, Sherry. No, yeah, go so, ahead. Yeah, so like you said, like there's never been a, a need for a regulatory pathway before for a rapid surveillance testing. So when this all hit, like they kind of cobbled something together based on what they've done in the past, but there hasn't been the need until, you know, this pandemic really. So that's why it's not going as smoothly and as quickly as you would like. Um, but it is something that they're working on. And, and mm -hmm. same with CMS, like CMS is trying, you know, the Health and Human Services is working really, really hard with them to get this regulatory pathway up because right now they're all just kind of like, you know, hand-waving it, but it is something they're working on. And, and, right. and Megan, to answer your question, thank you, Sarah. Um, to, to Sarah's point, I think there are a lot of efforts directed in how this can be done. And I, I also wanna make sure that we're clear, we want high quality rapid tests and accountability for manufacturers to do, you know, things well. Uh, because we want to be able to maintain public trust that these tests work and that they do what they're supposed to be doing. And there have been some issues in the past with, for instance, the rollout of antibody testing last spring, where it was it was kind of a free for all, and you know there were some quality issues and everything. So we we don't we don't want to go there, but we do want to make sure that the you know the people who are following the rules in terms of manufacturers that they can get um, you know timely approvals and that uh, they can produce and, and can maintain quality control so that we can have public trust. Because to, to, there's actually a pathway we talk about in our longer form of the commentary, which is about surveillance testing in the US, which is actually a form, a, 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 a legally sort of um, permissible uh, pathway for testing where the FDA does not actually regulate surveillance testing. And so manufacturers uh, who don't have FDA approval can do surveillance testing in the sense that you can do a test um, you can basically, uh, if you have a, a, a positive result or an inconclusive result, you can tell people, please go get a confirmatory, you know, um, diagnostic test, like a molecular PCR test. And so that is actually being done now, and it's being done now for, for COVID. But what we would like would be if it weren't that, you know, difficult to find that pathway and for people to, to sort of um, have to explore those avenues that, that aren't as well regulated because there are better pathways that, that would be suitable. Unfortunately, because that's not the case, surveillance testing is one of the pathways in the US is allowing people to move forward with testing um, in the absence of the supply. Because the other thing, Megan, that you're bringing up is the fact that you know you can't go to CVS and buy a rapid test right now. Um, right. You're, gonna, you're gonna start to be able to because of some of the recent approvals. But the reason why you haven't been able to do that is because when, for instance, um, Abbott has had a big contract to sell 150 million tests to the US government. And they sent them directly to the states and to people who, who needed them, uh, but in various agencies. So they weren't really um, for sale for public consumption. And that's part of the problem that the supply of the tests that have been made available for early entrance has been used by um, you know, the people who were able to get them first and not for wide public consumption, which is something we're trying to change. Um, thank, thank you, you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, Ken, go ahead. Oh, sorry. There you go. So, sorry, Ken. Can you unmute? Are you able to unmute? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I thought you were going to do it for me. Um, my questions are two. First of all, with the NFL, if they've almost had a million tests, where did they get all their tests? I'm a little confused. It is, yeah, it's interesting. And I, you know, I think, you know, there, there are legal pathways by which they got their tests. And I, I also, um, honestly, I, I'm not exactly sure. I think, yeah, Abbott tests. So they have contracts with uh, maybe directly oh. with Abbott, it sounds like. But I, I, one thing I want to bring up quickly, Ken, related to that question is 
I, I don't, uh, I, I want to caution people from sort of, you know, demonizing, not that you're doing this, but sort of saying, oh, policymakers and, and sports fans and Hollywood people, you know, you're doing these things and you have access and, and you know, you, it's, it's, it's unfair. What I would kind of, I think a helpful framing would be, you have been doing this because you had access. How can you help expand access for the rest of us? And I think using those examples to try to promote positive change because they clearly they think they work and they've been using them, you know, and, and our elected representatives in government in the US have been using them, you know, for months at this point. How can we allow them to expand that access for everyone else as equitably as possible? So um, I do, that doesn't exactly answer your direct question, but I think it's worth saying. Well, I was actually going to go the opposite direction with it. I thought it would be a great chance to everyone watch the Super Bowl and um, especially the religious United States who love football. Um, I would have thought you could leverage the fact that the NF that the Super Bowl was able to happen because of rapid testing would be a great in. Yeah. You have to find one superstar. I mean, if you can get even, even if it's not Brady, even if it's the guy who lost, it'd be good enough yeah. because they were able to play but the game. Yeah, if Brady hears about this and he's interested, we would love to have Tom Brady work with us on this. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, I, I, I'm disappointed Dr. Mina had to leave, but um, he, in an earlier podcast, he talked about the success in, Slo I think it was Slovakia, where they did use the paper test. And I wondered, mm -hmm. I wanted to find out a follow up on that, maybe one of you can, about how well that's worked, because a precedent of another country be actively and effectively using it is the most compelling evidence in my book. I'm an epidemiologist. That's the most compelling evidence in my book. Absolutely. So I'm wondering if there were a how it had gone in Slovakia more recently, and how many other countries have tried it. Thank you, Ken. That's a great example to bring up. Um, and and they've been uh, you know working on these uh, country level interventions uh, for several months. And the initial evaluation of their rollout, the initial rollout they did, uh, basically they 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 they, t they tested most of the population, and then they did a follow up where they they tested again, especially in the high. Um, the high prevalence areas. And the evaluation of that initial rollout was very positive. And they, the, the, ana the analysis of that um, is, uh, it strongly favors the idea that rapid testing helped um, reduce spread, especially because they were able to promote uh, supported isolation. It's one of the case studies that we bring up in, 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 uh, the, in our commentary, in, in, especially in the longer form. Um, and they actually are doing some follow-ups in Slovakia where they're doing further rollouts of rapid tests because of that initial success. So I don't know if anyone who's on the call right now knows anything else uh, that's more and up to date than that, but it, it has been uh, going reasonably well and there was a lot of government support to make that reasonably successful. Have they done better than other countries in Europe? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can answer off the top of my head about that. It's just because there's been so much variability. So I don't know um, if, if uh, anyone who's still on the call might be able to answer that. But that's also something we can look into. I think one of the challenges too is because the situation has been changing so much, even within the same place in terms of the peaks and you know different factors that affect transmission, it's hard to do direct comparisons, especially with different places. So I think um, that's, that's one of the limitations in kind of the analysis. But I think uh, it's something that we're looking at. I know that in Liverpool, they're also looking at that question of whether you know, how, how the impact of rapid tests has been on different subpopulations and how to improve access and how to, how to demonstrate that it can be effective on a population level. Thank you. My last little question is with the new variants, um, do you see any impact of the new variants? Because it looks like from what I've read that there's about to be an explosion of cases in, the, in North America as a result of the Super Bowl parties combined with the new variants. And so it seems to me all the more urgent to get these paper tests out and about. Yes, could not agree with you more. I think you're spot on with that, Ken. And, and I think that's one of the challenges uh, that, that right now, I think, you know, places I, I know in Boston, for instance, are starting to loosen restrictions because the cases have started to go down a little bit. And uh, there was a recent headline that basically said, we're in the eye of the storm right now in the sense that the cases may start to dip because that's just what happens in epidemics and pandemics. But the reality is if we're not careful, they could very easily go up again and overwhelm our, our hospital system and continue to perpetuate the epidemic. And in particular, there was a really good uh, feature in the Washington Post lately, I believe, that was speaking to the point about the variants and the fact that now that people are vaccinated and they're being exposed to the variants, that if there are variants that can still infect people even though they're vaccinated, as we've seen with some of the variants, that then you're basically creating selective pressure so that 
you're, you're allowing the variants to continue to spread even in populations that may have a vaccine protection from the vaccine for certain subtypes of the virus um, and that that could itself be uh, really problematic. So I, I, I agree with you that I mean, we don't wanna find out what the results of that uncontrolled evolution experiment are. And I think what we really wanna do is we wanna say, okay, we have a rapid test, we have the technology, how do we implement this in a way that's effective? How do we scale a production? How do we work with manufacturers? How do we work with everyday people to make sure that they understand the best practices so far and, and do their best and iterate so that we can try to find the best solution. So I think that's absolutely spot on then, Ken, thank you. Last little comment, uh, there's a great article, several articles by a fellow named Andre, Andrew Nikiforik in something called the TIE, where he's called Getting to Zero and how important it is with the new variants. I'll put it in the chat. Great, thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ken. And um, uh, Samira, I think you're our, our last voice here today. So that we can wrap up. Thank you, Hi. Samira. Uh, uh, this was primarily for uh, Michael Mina, but uh, somebody may be able to answer it. Uh, some of this, uh, Contra uh, discussion, or at least the initial over framing it as PCR versus uh, antigen. Uh, some of us in here in DC, actually about like 20 of us, we've been trying to get an answer to the question that if you have a coronavirus other than COVID, uh, SARS-2, does the PC, can the PCR test yield a positive result? And there's so much, there's been considerable equivocation and, and seemingly controversy over this. And I wondered if you would come across it. And if so, uh, do you have any references uh, or can answer that question? Thank you. So uh, I think my, my quick response based on what I've seen, and there may be folks here who, who may have more specific expertise is that as, as my, Dr. Minna said earlier, the specificity is very good. So we know that that it's it's reasonably specific for COVID-19. And the other thing that's really good about the antigen tests, especially with regard to the point you brought up on uh, variants, Ken, is that because of the way that the um, the variants are typically on the outside of the virus, the spike yeah. protein, and so the variants, those change more quickly because of the selective pressure from the population. So the vaccines are made from those spike proteins that are kind of on the outside of the virus. But the rapid tests actually are made from protein that's on the inside of the virus. And that changes less quickly generally because there's less selective pressure and there's more of it, which is why it's better for the, the rapid tests. I, I, so, think the, I think the specificity uh, at that point I've heard many times also, but uh, I've also heard Dr. Minna say how, how close they are, you know, that, and uh, in, in terms of differentiating uh, I, it seems like there's been a controversy. Maybe Irene can even speak to it vis-a-vis uh, -vis in England and and in the United States. So I'm I'm not sure. If, you know, reasonable can mean that it can possibly pick up uh, yield a positive result with if there's another coronavirus infected with it. Yeah, so I, I think we're just going to have to look up what the data says on that right now. My understanding yeah. is that it's it's that the rapid tests are reasonably or you know very specific for uh, COVID nineteen or the virus that causes COVID nineteen SARS v two. So if anyone else has a comment you want to share right now on that, uh, please go ahead. Otherwise, we can um, say so. I, I think also there there are different um, situations that have played out over time in terms of some of the first generation rapid tests and some of the sensitivity and specificity issues. But the, the current model tests that are made by uh, high quality manufacturers are very very good. And so uh, you know it's always important to make sure that those quality standards are maintained and that if there there are changes like uh, variants or other other things that those are um, taken into consideration so that you can you can continue to be confident that you're getting the results that you're getting. So, but thank you for bringing up that point. It's important to be thinking about that. So thank you everyone. Well, I appreciate everyone's um, efforts. And I think that I'm just gonna, um, you know, close our session if that's okay. And we're happy to continue to have the conversation. There's still a lot of work to be done. So thank you very much everyone for your, your support and, um, and everything. And we look forward to continuing the conversation later. Thank you. Take care everyone. Bye.